Alrighty. So let's start here. Uh, my name is Joey R.K. I'm a general dentist. Uh, I practice in Stewart, Florida. Um, I graduated uh, my undergrad in FIU, which is down in Miami, Florida. I have my bachelor's in biology. Oh, whoops, sorry about that. Bachelor's in, my, in biology. I had a minor in chemistry and I graduated from dental school in 2020, so not too, too long ago, uh, from Nova Southeastern in Fort Lauderdale. So that's a quick pit, quick tidbit about me. Uh, this is a PowerPoint from before, so no one's going to ask questions now. We'll save this for the end. Tiny bit about me. I'm 30, uh, born and raised in Miami. Um, I already talked about my degrees and where I graduated from, and I'm also a clinical director for a private dental group uh, in Southeast Florida. We have 11 offices. Uh, goal is to expand probably up to 25-ish or plus more offices in the next five to 10 years. Uh, so I have my hands busy, not only from a clinical perspective, um, but also in the administrative and, and mentorship portion, which comes with that uh, part of the job. I am a fellow in the International Congress of Oral Implantologists, and I have a bunch of other affiliations with the ADA, the FDA. Um, I'm a member and speaker for the Treasure Coast Dental Association. I'm also a member of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry and the AGD. So again, I keep my hands busy 24-7. Uh, and a little bit of what I currently do. So I'm sure that this is not the first uh, dental shadowing video you guys have seen. Um, and you guys have probably already spoken to, uh, to other dentists. So you should be a little bit familiar uh, with, with a couple of these things. So I do place implants and I do a lot of implant surgery, uh, veneers, crown bridges, partial dentures, complete dentures, full mouth rehabs, ranging from crown and bridge rehabs to implant rehabilitations, uh, extractions, bone grafting, fillings. I treat periodontal disease, TMJ disorders, which is the disorders of the joints in the jaw. Um, I also diagnose and treat pathology. I do whitening, Invisalign, snap indentures, hybrid all in X, which we'll talk about. We will talk about at the end of the, um, the session with one of my cases that I'll walk you through. And I do a lot of digital design and dental photography. Um, dentistry has changed dramatically in the last five to 10 years compared to what it was 20 to 30 years ago with, you know, the goopy impressions and all that. My office is fully digital. Um, there is almost never a time where I have to use the goopy impression stuff uh, only because of the latest advancements. Um, and I stay on top of that uh, in the day to day. So we will talk about a couple of things that I do in that regard. So going through a typical day of mine, I see about 20 to 25 patients, which is a lot. Um, I intend on cutting that down a little bit as the office grows. But in my office, I have two hygienists. I have two front desk. I have two dental assistants that are with me all day long. And then obviously my office manager who runs the show from uh, the front of the office perspective. And I generally do... Uh, general de de dentistry, so crowns, bridges, fillings, partials, and dentures. Um, but there are one-off cases that that I will schedule for an entire day with, with a single patient, uh, where I can spend seven to eight hours on a full surgery, uh, placing eight implants, extracting you know thirty plus teeth, uh, all in one session. Um, and those are the days that I typically like. Um, because instead of the running around and bouncing between room to room, um, it's a high value procedure. It's one patient, um, and I focus on one thing the entire day. So those are basically my, uh, my uh, favorite days. And I also have to be available 24 seven for the other dentists in the dental group that I'm the director for. So my cell phone is on my hip, um, all day long and I can be between two patients and all, and I can get a call. What do I do for for this case, or what type of composite is this, or what type of implant is this? How do I how do I restore this? So aside from juggling a full time office, I also um, uh, am available to a lot of other dentists who ask me questions and stuff. And w within the scope of my knowledge, um, I'll always lend a hand to, uh, to help them out and and to make their day a little bit easier. 
So life outside the office, I do give lectures, uh, not only to the pre-dent and the dental community, um, but also for um, for uh, colleges. So on the on the lower left, uh, we give a presentation to the D3s and D4s at Nova Southeastern on what to expect outside of dental school. So in that lecture, we talked about how do you read a contract? You know, when you're about to sign up for a job, what questions to ask? You know, it's it's questions like that 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 they will not teach you in dental school. Some schools maybe, but the majority do not. So we took the time to put together a nice presentation. We took them all out to a dinner um, and we gave them some valuable tips. And the middle photo is a presentation I gave on dental photography and how to use a DSLR camera and the flashes and all that good stuff um, to our dental group. And then on the right side of the presentation I gave on digital dentistry, 3D printing and all the latest advancements. So I do a lot of this outside the office um, and I truly enjoyed doing it. Uh, we do some dental related events, so we'll go down to the dental school um, and take everybody out for drinks and food, um, just to network and socialize. We take out our uh, our dental group often, all the doctors, we have doctor dinners and stuff like that. So the dentistry really lives not only inside the office, but also outside the office. Aside from that, I also spend a good majority of my time traveling nationwide, um, staying up to date and doing continuing ed courses, whether it's on cosmetics or implant placement or mechanics or just everything. Um, and it's not something that you're only going to do at the beginning when you're outside of dental school. It's something that you're going to do probably till the day you retire. Um, dentistry is evolving at a rapid rate. Uh, almost every day there is a change or an advancement and you, and you got to stay on top of it. Um, to be able to to provide your patients the gold standard of treatment. So that's a, a, another big part of my life. And then ECOS is um, is obviously the, uh, the dental group that I work for. Um, and we have weekly meetings uh, regarding the operations, regarding the doctors, regarding the staff, regarding how things are being done. Um, so that's also part of my life every week and every day, pretty much. And... Um, and the last thing is the mentorship. So uh, in the middle is one of the doctors in our group who came to shadow me uh, while we were doing a, an, imp an implant procedure, um, extracting a full lower arch and placing four implants. And on the right is a dental student who came to observe as we were doing a, a cosmetic veneer case. My ergonomics in that photo is not that good. I should be sitting a little bit more upright, uh, but we can skip that. Um, so that's pretty much what I do on a day-to-day -day um, from the office to, uh, to the mentorship, to the lectures, to the CE. Um, so it's, it's a lot to juggle, but I'm not complaining. I, I, I absolutely love what I do. I'm, I'm obsessed with it. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, you can see that, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty much 90% of my life. So, uh, now that we've gotten that out of the way, uh, let's walk through a case. Um, that I am nearing completion. So this is a patient that came to see me probably six months ago as a new patient. Uh, we took the full set of x-rays, took all the photos, the periodontal charting, all that good stuff. And she presented just like this, just like the photo you see on the right side. And she wanted to know what could I do to fix my mouth? I've, ne I've neglected them for uh, 20 plus years, uh, things are loose, things are breaking, I'm missing teeth, I have gaps. Um, so this is probably one of the trickiest cases I've ever done. So after uh, lo looking at her x-rays and seeing all the bone loss and the cavities, I pretty much determined that nothing on the upper arch was, was restorable. And on the lower arch, we could get by with maybe an implant, some crown and bridge, and, and obviously with cosmetics and aesthetics in mind. So the treatment plan here was to extract everything on the upper, place six implants, and do something called a hybrid denture, which is a permanent horseshoe-shaped restoration that goes screwed into the uh, jaw. And then on the lower, we did a bunch of crowns and bridges. And we'll walk through all that uh, uh, together. Uh, and basically, from beginning to end, over a span of six months, it took 12 visits. Um, so the the first visit was me meeting her and giving her the treatment plan and and recommending uh, what's best. 
Then we took a CT scan so I can evaluate the bone levels and intraoral scans with our dental scanner, which looks something like this. And what this does is that this, this replaces the goopy impression material. So uh, I'm a level 12 gagger. Uh, I gag for, with brushing my teeth. Um, so I can appreciate this probably a lot more than most. Um, but no impressions have to be done in my office for that reason. Um, and patients seem to really like that. So uh, it also gives us better accuracy with our impressions. Um, and it's also really cool. So only a lot of benefits to having an intraoral scanner. Um, then we scheduled her, her upper arch surgery, which was a five-hour surgery from beginning to end. I followed up with her in two weeks. Then I followed up with her in six weeks. And then while things were healing with the implants, implants normally take anywhere from three to six months to heal. So after the implants were put in, she actually got a temporary hybrid, which is not that pretty, but she had something to walk out uh, with on the day of surgery. So that way she had teeth and she was presentable. Um, so while that was healing, I told her, let's let, let let's work on the lower arch um, in the interim. So that way we aren't wasting time. So we got right to it. We took some more digital impressions of her lower arch for uh, a wax up. Then we prepped her lower arch for crowns and bridges. And we did an implant on her lower right. Then we completely delivered the lower arch. Um, and then we started with the upper arch. So uh, I'm actually going to play a quick video here. I found this on my Instagram and I was like, this would be great. So here's the day of surgery. I'm getting her nice and numb all the way across. Injecting here with septicane one of my favorite anesthetics because it does a really nice job. It's a little sped up. I don't extract teeth this quickly. And if you guys are eating or near dinner time, I apologize. But this is real life. So um, I, I removed the teeth. And, and that jig you see inside her mouth now is called a 3D printed surgical guide. I designed those myself and I 3D print them myself here in the office. And what that does is it guides my drill on the day of, of, uh, of implant surgery. So that way my implants are placed in the exact same position as it is in my digital planning software. So this gives me really, really good accuracy. Um, it takes pretty much all the guesswork in the angulation of the implants uh, to make sure that everything is nice and straight and parallel. So after it's all done, I'm closing her up and I, I bone grafted the sites. This is what the, the arch looks like the day of surgery. And this is me painting her temporary prosthetic that she, that, that she walked out with the day of surgery. And that's her. So she walked in with a bunch of broken teeth and she walked out like that. Okay. So the video finished. Those are the x-rays of the implants. Looking real good. And that's pretty much it. So... Here's how we started. You can see that her teeth are flared out. You have cavities along the gum line, uh, broken, fractured teeth here. They're all loose and wobbly. So um, here are the 3D printed surgical guides that I designed in office. And that's the software there on the right side where I'm basically planning each and, in, uh, each and every individual implant with a combination of her intraoral scans that, that we get from the intraoral scanner and then her CT scan, which is the, the big spinning uh, scan. Um, and, I mesh the, uh, and I mesh those together <clears throat> in the software so I can create this really cool guide. And this is what it looks like once it gets printed out. And then these little supports are broken off and then it's ready for day of surgery. So again, the teeth were removed, implants placed, um, this is the, the digital file of her teeth or of her temporary teeth, um, that I also 3d printed here in the office. Um, so from the start of the surgery to when we were ready to start this designing process, probably took about two and a half hours. Um, so we left her in the room, we turned off the lights, we gave her a blanket and she basically took a nap for about an hour. And in that hour, I came back here and I was fabricating this. So I was designing this and 3D printing this. Then I, um, so then I uh, 3D print it and it comes out completely white. And then to add the gums, I actually add that in manually. So there's a little artistic flair here. 
uh, to make sure that you're adding uh, enough pink and enough red, but not too much where it looks uh, overly done. I think I actually overly did this one just a bit. Um, I would have liked for it to stay looking like this, but again, it's just a temporary. Um, it's not long term. So this was actually screwed into those implants same day. Um, and she got to walk out like that. And that's her on the day of surgery. I believe I asked her to close down here. Maybe, maybe not. She was out of it because she was also sedated. There we go. Nice. So the upper arch started. Then we head on to the lower arch. On the lower arch, uh, she had a failed tooth here, which was not restorable. So I planned her for a bridge on this side, individual crowns on all of these teeth. And then I placed an implant on her lower right side, which is over here, her lower right, um, to restore the lower arch. This is the temporary. And this is what she uh, looked like after the lowers were restored. Uh, obviously, the color is a lot better. There's no more cavities at the gum line. And now she has teeth in areas she had teeth missing. Um, and now fast forward to, to, to just about two weeks ago. Um, the upper arch is completely healed. Um, uh, the implants have, have integrated fully. It's been about six months total. Um, so now we're in the process of making her, her second set of temporaries. So a question might be, why do you go from one temporary to another temporary and then maybe to the final instead of from temporary to final? And the answer to that is you don't have to. But what I like to do is, is I like to fine tune all the details as close as possible in the temporaries before you go to the final prosthetic. So that way, if there's any changes, it's very easy to do. If you jump, if you jump directly to a final result, or, or a final prosthetic and the color's off, if the shape is off, if the bite is too high um, and you have to redo that, it's a very costly thing to fix because the cost of a temporary is very cheap compared to the cost of the final prosthetic. So these little things here that I have screwed into each of her six implants are called digital scan bodies. And they have a surface geometry on the outside of them, which allows my lab tech to basically invert them and throw them into software to know the exact position of those implants. And again, I capture all of this using my digital scanner um, and I send this over to my lab tech. What I get back is something beautiful that looks like this. And again, this is still only a temporary. This is not the final prosthetic. Um, so I saw her two weeks ago um, to remove the first temp. Um, yes. um, Oh, there's a little bit of reverb there. There we go. Um, so I placed this second uh, temporary in, and this is what she looked like. Uh, obviously, massive, massive change from how she initially presented to me six months ago. This is almost good enough to be the final. But again, there were a couple things that jumped out to me, especially in the smile. I think that this tooth, this tooth, and this tooth are maybe 0.3 millimeters too long uh, compared to the teeth on this side. I think the shade of the upper arch is about half a shade too bright. Um, but, but again, this is something which comes with practice and training the eye. This is what dental school is for. This is what the real world is for. Um, and the more you do it, the better you uh, get at it. I am by no means an expert um, on prosthetics like this. But I've, I've done enough where I can fine tune things to make it close to perfect as possible. So here's some some perspective on how far she has come from from back then to now. Uh, light, light, night and day difference. Um, and this is her smile again uh, from back then to now. And she's obviously very, very, very happy. Um, and I'll be delivering her final prosthetic probably in uh, two or three weeks. Um, with those changes made, and that'll be a completed case. So that's case number one that I have walked through. Um, for this second case, we're going to walk through uh, veneers and crowns. So this is a purely an aesthetic case. This patient presented with uh, four existing crowns he had done. 
Um, and these crowns were all different shapes, different shades, different lengths, um, really weird colors around the gum line and the rest of his teeth. So these back areas are called buccal corridors. They weren't full. They were kind of like slanted inward. So that's something he wanted addressed. He wanted his smile to look more full, more vibrant. So I told him, hold my beer. Um, so first visit, uh, we did an implant consult. I took a gazillion photos on him, full face shots, retracted side view profile, um, up, down, all around. Um, and we also took some digital scans. Those digital scans will go to my lab and my lab will fabricate a wax up, a, a digital mock-up um, of what the final result should look like or what I want the final result to be before I even start. So that way you, you always start a case thinking with the end in mind um, and digital dentistry has made that process so much easier uh, for all of my cases. So we'll, we'll, we'll bring him back after I have the mock and we will prep him. And by prepping, I mean, I'm going to remove the four crowns he has on his anterior four teeth. And then I will do some very conservative um, uh, veneer pre preparations on the three teeth to the right and the three teeth to the left. Um, then he will leave in temporary veneers and crowns. Uh, we'll check his bite. We'll send the case to the lab and then we'll deliver his veneers and crowns and then uh, take some photos. So let's walk through the case. This is how he presented. Um, again, just very often color uh, between these teeth and his front four teeth. These two crowns are, have, have different textures, uh, darkness around the gum. Uh, so we had a lot to uh, work with here. This is my digital mock-up that um, I get back from my lab uh, based off of his digital scans. So they will introduce um, something called digital wax or a, a digital wax up, basically showing what I want the final result to be. So all the areas in white is what we're going to be putting on his teeth, uh, the four crowns in the front and then the laminate porcelain veneers, uh, which only covers the outer layers of the teeth. So I was happy with that mock-up and so was he, he was ecstatic. And this is prep day. So on prep day, I removed his front four crowns. Obviously, we had some, some dark shades underneath, which is called a stump shade. Um, we did some very conservative veneer preps on the outsides of these three and these three teeth um, and got a really, really nice impression. Once the impression is done, I make him temporary crowns based off of this wax up. So uh, this wax up will also come with a mold that I will use on the day of preparation to give him these temporaries in that exact shape um, all the way up to his second premolars. Now, one thing that, that jumped out to us here was shade. So his teeth were still kind of yellow. And what I informed him to do was to go and do whitening between this visit and between his final. Um, so I informed my lab, don't do it in this shade. I want it to be a couple shades lighter uh, so we can match it with the lowers after we were done with that cosmetic bleaching. So he did, and he followed it to a T. These are the temporaries. And these are the ceramics back from my lab. I use a lab in, uh, in California called Frontier Dental Lab. They are amazing. Um, and they always give me just beautiful, lifelike, and natural results. Obviously, I like a lot of photography, so I take a lot of photography with, with a special lighting and background effects, so you can see all the, the uh, textures and the translucencies and all the things that make teeth look natural. Teeth are not supposed to look one, one solid shade. They are not supposed to uh, be flat and bulky. Teeth are supposed to have, I'm sorry about that. Teeth are supposed to have texture. Te teeth are supposed to have um, a vibrance. They are supposed to have depth. Um, they should not look like opaque chiclets. Um, so that's what we, we shot for. And this was delivery day. So here we inserted uh, the four crowns in the front and the three veneers on either side. And obviously big, big, big difference. And you can see how much lighter his lower arch um, became after the uh, bleaching. Um, and this is a smile. He ended up with a brand new smile, 
uh, ecstatic. He loved it. He's been raving about it nonstop. I'm obviously very, very happy with it. Um, but yeah, again, with him, we uh, came a long way. Um, and this is one of the nice sides of the of the dentistry is the before and after. And if there's a piece of advice that I could give is dental school will teach you a little bit about photography, but it's not going to teach you a lot. Uh, to learn really good photography, you're going to have to take it upon yourself or take a course. Um, get into it early because it's only going to make your 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 life a lot easier at the end in terms of being able to have cases to show before and afters, but also with good communication amongst your colleagues, amongst your dental lab. Uh, uh, definitely, definitely, definitely so something that you have to have incorporated um, in your day to day. So that's pretty much it. I kept it short and sweet. I showed you all the uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, the uh, the bloody, and the aesthetics. Um, I will leave this time now. If there are any questions um, that anyone would like to have answered, and again, here's my my Instagram. I I post daily uh everything i do uh, from the simple stuff all the way up to the complex stuff i show the blood i i do uh step by steps and tutorials um i like to help a lot so it's something that i enjoy doing if you have any other questions uh you can follow me there um and i and i'd be happy to answer perfect thank you so much dr rk that was an awesome presentation um we're going to open the floor up to questions now to the um 28 of you with us. Um, so feel free to send a message in the chat a question for Dr. RK. Um, and then Shailen will facilitate the QA portion here now. Cool. And I guess I have a question right away. Yeah. First. Um, so with, with dentistry, obviously um, dental school will teach you okay. a little bit photography and um, things like you had mentioned, um, but how did you really get into um, all the 3D printing, the photography? How did you go about kind of learning that after dental school? So the year that I was graduating that, uh, dental school, I bought myself a DSLR uh, only because I knew that that the high-end photography is where the marketing is going to come into, but it, it evolved into so much more than that. The majority of what I learned was almost all self-taught. I did take a couple of courses. Uh, Dr. Miguel Ortiz has a great photography course. Dr. Kaleen Pop also has a great online course where he teaches, uh, you know, uh, what, what f-stop is, what flash intensity is, ISO, uh, white balance, the right lenses, the right camera bodies, um, the right flashes. There's so much to it. Um, I gave a presentation on photography alone and it took me five hours. It took me five hours to get through all of it, nonstop talking, um, which, which was a lot. Um, and everyone who I have convinced to get into it has been just floored at like, how did I not do this before? So that's one of my biggest, uh, advices is to get into it early with dental school is going to be tough because in dental school, HIPAA is a pain in the butt. When you're out in the real world, it's much easier to give a photo consent form and they sign it. It's part of their new patient paperwork. So 99% of my patients have all that built in uh, before they even see me. Um, every once in a while, we will get someone who says, I don't want my photo taken. And that's fine. And I won't take photos of them. Um, but uh, it, it, it's just allowed me to incorporate it into my everyday workflow. Um, and again, it's just awesome. Uh, we had a question here. Did you know that you wanted to go into cosmetic dentistry during dental school? Or was there another specialty that you almost chose? So that's actually a really, really, really good question. You will not know what specialty you'll like or want to do probably till your third or fourth year. And the reason why I say that is your first and second year is all book work. And, 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 and lab work. You're going to be learning biology and biochemistry all over again. You thought that you were done with it in undergrad? <laughs> well, it's coming all right back. You're going to learn anatomy all over again, and physiology all over again, and dental anatomy, and neurology, and histology, pathology, all the ologies. 
And that's basically what you do the first year normally is comprised of. Your second year is where you start to get a little bit more hands-on into the uh, the uh, dental lab portion, or you, you start to drill on mannequins and doing wax ups and and practicing on plastic teeth. You ne you never really know what you like because you don't get that patient interaction until your third year. And I'm speaking generally because every dental school is different and their curriculum is different. But at least where I went to school, my third year is when I actually started to uh, treat patients. And most people, once they started to realize, you know, I hate fillings, I hate crowns, I'm going to be an orthodontist. Or some people love blood and surgery and they're like, I want to be an oral surgeon. I think for me personally, I chose the general practice route because there's so much variety. You know, if, if someone wants to do root canals all day long, go be an, go be an endodontist. If someone want, wants to treat gums, bone, and do implants, go be a periodontist. If you want to just yank teeth and deal with trauma and be a, a real doctor, I'm just kidding. Uh, go, go, go be an oral surgeon. Uh, I, I'm just kidding about that comment. It's just, it's just funny. I, I hear it often. The reason why I like general is that every day is different to me. And there's nothing stopping me from still placing implants, from still doing gum surgery. Um, but you need to be careful. If you're going to be doing high-end procedures like this, you better be well-trained and get the proper education because you're held to the same standard as a specialist. So for example, if I place an implant and it fails and the oral surgeon places an implant and it fails, you know, and we both go to the board, the board of dentistry is going to look at us as equals. So I better have done that implant to the same standard an oral surgeon would have. Um, and that goes for anything. I just like general because, um, again, every day is different and there's so much variety in what I do. Um, and it just keeps me on my toes. All right. Lots of questions. Cool. Um, what do you see as the future of dentistry? And are there any emerging trends or technologies? Oh, absolutely. The future of dentistry is 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 exciting. Um, it's a little scary. AI is uh, is definitely becoming a part of everything we're doing. There are implant robots out there that are placing implants. Um, there one is called the XNAV. The other one is called the Yomi. Actually, my the oral surgeon who practices here in Stewart, he invented the Yomi. Um, so yeah, he's a pretty bad badass OS. Um, and AI as well is, is, is revamping the way we're practicing. Now, instead of having someone, uh, you know, hand wax a crown and, and then send it to mill and then cementing it, now AI is designing the crown for you. All you have to do is mark the margin. And even then, it's marking margins for you. Um, AI is a huge part of what's of, of the future of dentistry. There's also a software out called Pearl AI that is reading dental radiographs. It's finding cavities. It's finding bone loss. It's finding conditions that maybe a dentist's eyes might miss. And I think it's actually an awesome tool because I can read a set of x-rays 25 times a day and I'm sure I might miss something, you know, minuscule or small or maybe like uh, an incipient cavity that the software might illuminate and tell me. Um, so again, uh, technology is is evolving at a rapid pace um, and I'm excited for it, as long as it doesn't go overboard. Uh, next question, hello doctor, do dental schools let you use or teach how you use these lab tech machines or scanners during the course of the degree? And that is dependent on the dental school. Some dental schools are very technologically advanced um, which is amazing. And they all have the digital scanners and they have the milling machines and the five axis mills and ExoCAD and, and, and the digital design computers and platforms. I love schools like that because they're getting you ready for the real world. There are still schools out there teaching metal fillings. And I'll say it again. And if they're watching now, shame on you. Uh, metal fillings, although there is a place for them, the amount of time that they spent teaching me that was probably a good six months. I could have spent a lot of my time doing other things to advance myself to be better prepared for uh, the outside of school. Obviously, you still need to learn how to take a traditional impression because what if this stops working? You have to have a backup or at least the knowledge on, on, 
on what you need to do if you have to pivot. And pivoting is something that happens every day. Um, but again, don't don't use that as an excuse to not teach you the latest and greatest. So when when picking a school, definitely ask questions. What are you doing to stay ahead of the trends? Do you guys do digital design, digital scanning? Um, you know, what are you doing to stay ahead of the curve? And those are questions you're allowed to ask. Um, so that is huge. Thank you for the opportunity. Could you tell us a little bit about your journey before you got into dental school? Like what made you so interested? Okay, so interesting story. I actually was supposed to go to medical school. Um, I took the MCAT. Um, I was about to apply. And I made the mistake of, <laughs> it's kind of ironic. Uh, I made the mistake of not shadowing. So kind of ironic we're here. Um I did all of my undergrad. I did all my 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 uh, requisites. I took my MCAT. I did all that stuff, and then I went to shadow. And then I learned really quickly that I hid in medicine. Medicine sucked. Um, it at least the people who I shadowed, which was a lot. Um, medicine nowadays is not the same way as it was back in the day. They're overworked and underpaid. If you want to start a family, it's rough with residency and stuff like that. Um, I chose dentistry mainly because at the time I was dating someone whose dad was an endodontist and she told me or uh, he told me uh, to shadow a bunch of his friends. And I did. And I've been very handy my entire life. I, I, I built, you know, like walls. I've, I, I do plumbing, electrical. I'm very handy. So um, this was kind of like a way to tie in my hand skills with my love of medicine um, and dentistry led that up for me. Um, also, that uh, the work week is amazing. Monday to Friday, nine to five, or Monday to Thursday, like a half day on Friday. You're never going to get that in medicine unless, unless if you're a dermatologist. Um, so the, the work-life balance with dentistry is way better. Um, and the pay is the same or a lot more. So uh, I'm going to jump to the next question. Uh, what would you say was the most difficult part of dental school for you? And how did you overcome the uh, challenge? The first year or two is probably the hardest, um, at least for me. And it's not that it was hard, is that it's a lot. And the best way that I could equate that to is drinking water out of a fire hydrant. And if there's anyone who's about to start uh, dental school now, or if you're in school already, you know what I mean when I say that it's that they are not giving you difficult classes is that they're giving you a lot of classes, a lot of information, a lot of assignments, a lot of reading, a lot of exams, a lot of studying all at the same time. So whereas in undergrad, you had your you know six classes and you scheduled them throughout the day and you had time and partying and tailgates and stuff. Dental school is not not like that. You will still have time for a work life balance or a school life balance, or you have to have uh, time to decompress, but it's very, very different. Dental school is a full-time job. Um, so that to me was probably the 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 biggest part. Um, other people had had a different type of challenge. So people who were not good with their hands, who excelled in their first or second year, did not excel in their third or fourth, where they had to excel clinically or in the sim lab. Um, so I get, I guess it just depends on what type of person you are. If you are a genius brainiac with photographic memory, the first year and a half are going to be easy. But if you suck with your hands, uh, you're going to have a harder time and, and, and a larger learning curve uh, to overcome. If it's, the other, if it's the other way around, it's going to be vice versa. The next question is, what percentage would you say is the theory that we need to do and what percentage is the practical hands-on stuff in your experience? So I'm going to assume that we're talking about dental school to real life. That's a very good question. So I would have to say of the insane amount of information that went into my brain over those four incredible years, probably 60% of it is relevant. Uh, there's a good 30 to 40% that isn't. Um, there's a lot of theory that you just won't use. Um, and there's a lot of theory that that's outdated. There's a lot of theory being taught in dental schools that, that if they're not up to date, 
is stuff that they were teaching back in the 80s, in the 90s, um, which you can forget about. Um, but it's it's stuff you have to just learn and, and go through, like the Krebs cycle. How many times have we have, have we gone through that in undergrad? In dental school, the Krebs cycle came back. Um, no one cares how many oxidative, uh, oxidative cycles it takes um, or the other cycle, whatever, who cares? All that crap is going to come back in your first year. Um, and it's going to be something that you're just going to have to digest, do it and forget about it. Once you get into the sim lab, once you get into year three and year four, which is a little bit more, more clinical based, pay attention there a little bit more because a lot of that is going to be relevant. Did you know about 3D printing and rendering before dental school? Absolutely not. And how in depth did they teach you about it in school? And the answer to that is zero. In my school, they did not teach anything on, uh, on 3D printing. Uh, they have advanced in the last uh, three years since then. I actually visited last year and they do have an ExoCAD lab and mills and 3D printing dentures and milling dentures and all that cool stuff. So I'm glad that they have advanced a little bit in that regard. Uh, they they did have milling machines while I was there, which is um, the older way of doing things. But now with 3D printing technology, that has changed so much. Um, and I look forward to seeing schools implement it more and more because day one outside of school, that's what's already happening. Um, what skills uh, as a dentist have contributed to you becoming a better lecturer over time? I think the biggest thing that has helped me become a better lecturer is experience. So every time I talk about a case or if I talk about photography or if I talk about 3D printing, all the tidbits that I give or all the 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 minor points which seem as minor that are actually probably major is because I screwed up somewhere along the way. Um, 3D printing was a big lear learning curve for me. I learned it in depth. I had a bunch of failures. But now, because of that, I can explain the process in such a way that I can break it down to anyone and make it make sense. But the ability the uh, the ability to to do that has to come with failures. And failures are going to happen. Not only in that, in dentistry, um, i've I've had crowns break. I've had fillings fail, um, but I've learned from them. And that's what I touch on. Uh, touch upon when I'm when I give my my talks is not only my successes it's very easy to sit here and put a before and after and tell you I'm perfect the answer to that is absolutely not and if any de dentist out there says they are they're 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 full of it um I think failures are one of the best ways to learn because it's one way to really stick it inside your brain to never do it again and to really learn from that um so that I think is one of the biggest things has that has helped me uh, become better at speaking um, about certain topics. Funny one. What did you feel getting into dental school is difficult or graduating is difficult? Both. Uh, no. Getting into dental school is definitely a lot harder because you are siphoned down a big, big, big um, uh, filter until you get to your interviews. Once you're in, you really, really got to try hard to fail. Dental schools don't want you to fail out. Every year, there's going to be a couple. Mainly the first year is when the dental schools will weed out the ones who just can't do it or can't cut it. But dental schools don't want you to fail. Um, a lot of the public schools get stipends or government money based off of how many graduating students they have. Something they won't tell you. So um, schools want to get everybody across the finish line. Um, does that happen in every case? Absolutely not. Um, but definitely, de definitely the schools are there, or most of them are, to help you get to the end. Um, and once you're in, it's, it's just, it's, it's full speed ahead until, until you graduate. Uh, great story. Anytime. How do I, how do you spend how do you spend, manage your time and manage stress? Uh, in school, I spent a lot of my time studying and then a lot of my time partying. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I, I, I had, I had fun. I, uh, 
I'm blessed to have been part of a dental class that has given me lifelong friends. Um, four to five of my groomsmen in, in my wedding are, are uh, dentists and we all gra uh, graduated together. Uh, my best friend is a dentist and now he's studying to be an orthodontist. Um, one thing is for sure, you are going to love and hate these four years uh, equally. It, it, it's a roller coaster. It's an emotional battle. It's a physical battle. Um, and what makes that awesome is if you can get close to those around you who are going through the same thing. Um, and that's what my class did. I think my class was one of the tightest, closest classes that ever went through Nova. Um, and we love each other till, till this day. Um, so we spent our time studying together and working hard together. And we spent our time having fun together. So that's how I managed it well. Um, how did I study in dental school and how do I study now? Uh, very differently in dental school. It was like sitting down and studying for seven to eight hours straight with very little breaks, depending on the exams and stuff like that. And how I study now is obviously a lot different. I have a lot more to juggle now um, in terms of running an office and, and tending to the other doctors that I mentor uh, and writing up uh, lectures or putting together content or developing protocols or guidelines for our company. And then after all that's done, I have to come, uh, I have to go back home to my fiance and our two dogs. And I have to keep that afloat because it's also important to keep your personal life uh, in check and, and, and tending to that. Um, and then after all that is when I will either sit down and go through CE courses or online courses or fly out uh, and do courses or read through textbooks. I still read books. Um, they're all de dental related books. So they're, it, it's, it's much easier to read through than uh, photosynthesis. Um, but uh, that's how my life has changed to where I'm at now. And I believe that's the end of the questions. If anybody else want, wants to drop in a question, I'll be happy to take it. Thank you so much for answering all those questions for us. And thank you for your presentation, Dr. RK. Um, that will end our virtual shouting session for the day. Uh, this will be uploaded on our YouTube right after this um, for you to go back and watch whenever you want. Um, but thank you again, Dr. RK. Um, and thank you for all of us that were able to join us today. Um, one more question is like, yeah, any tips for anyone who wants to open their own practice in the future? Um, should you take any classes specifically? <laughs> so dental schools don't teach you anything about business at all. My, my recommendation is if you do want to open up your own office, don't do it immediately. Take a year or two, get out there, work for a private group, work for an office, work for a DSO. Um, get your feet wet to realize what it is you're getting into. Spend your time uh, focused on becoming a better clinician initially. Uh, there's plenty to master uh, without having to deal with the stress of lease agreements, hiring, firing, HR, uh, infrastructure, bills, uh, ordering supplies, insurance, uh, business accounts, CPAs, lawyers. You're, you're going to have a lot on your plate day one out of school, especially when that first filling show, shows up and you have no, no doctor behind you and you're on your own. Uh, get the clinical down first and then venture out into opening up your own. That's what I would recommend. I've seen plenty of scenarios where people straight out of school went to open up an office and it just tanked. Um, and it's sad because to manage both, both the clinical and the business side, unless if you already have a strong business background, or if you have a mom or dad or uncle who are dentists and they've already done it, that makes it a lot easier. But if you're not like myself, I'm the first doctor in my family or dentist, whatever. Um, uh, I took the clinical route first to get good clinically. Um, and now in the future, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about other options. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for no today, everyone. And thank you, Dr. K, for the virtual shadowing session. Um, my pleasure. Well, have a good night. And thank you, everyone, for joining. And we'll see you for the next one. No problem. Take care, guys.